Hello, you're listening to a sermon from Community Church in Prague, Oklahoma. At Community Church, we are all about loving God as a community and loving people in our community. If you live in the area, we would love for you to join us on a Sunday morning for coffee and fellowship at 930 or for service at 10 a.m. And now here is our guest preacher, Ben Husted, with part five of our series, Parables. So uh, when, when Pastor Wapsall called and asked if I would preach, he, and he was excited, we have his sermon series on the parables, and uh, th- this will be the last, you know, I'm asking you to do the last uh, week of that, uh, so you can preach on your favorite one. And I'll, immediately I thought, he's going to get all the good ones before I get there. <laughs> yeah, he's, you know, and... Uh, He'll get, the, he'll get one of my favorites anyway. And then the Holy Spirit just got excited in me about preaching from one of the parables of the Old Testament. Now, if you're like me, uh, you thought all the parables were in the New Testament, that Jesus spoke all the parables there were. But actually, Jesus was in a long, long line of wisdom teachers. You read what he said, and it was, it's wisdom teaching a lot of what he did. So he's in this long historical line of wisdom teachers. And the wisdom teachers used parables. And also the prophets used parables. The prophets used parables a lot. And especially if you look in the um, book of Ezekiel, the prophet, you see, I think he used it a lot. My least favorite parable in the world is in Ezekiel. I won't tell you which one that is. But um, there, there's one that's very familiar to everyone. That's the, the story of the, um, of the dry bones, the valley of the dry bones. And maybe you remember that story. Um, if you've been in church for very long, you probably remember that story. And it says um, in Ezekiel chapter 17, um, I hope this is the wrong one. That's a different one. See, I just left off a a verse. See, when you don't have this thing, then you can leave something off and nobody knows. But Ezekiel 1, 17, 1 and 2, he can't get back to it there. It says, God said to him, speak to the people in a parable. So, the prophets used parables all the time. And this, he follows that with his story about the great eagle who came and did all these things, and then he interprets that, that uh, story. It was a parable. In Hebrew, the word for parable comes from the, the root meaning to be similar. To be similar. So parables are often introduced by saying, um, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant who went looking for very valuable gems. And when he found one, he sold everything he had and went and bought that. Pastor uh, Wopsle spoke a couple weeks ago about from that parable. And I said, you are are the the gems that heaven is looking for. Uh, It's a really good message. Um, So it's it's usually... heaven is like, or the kingdom is like, or something is like, and this is this comparison, which is a, a parable. The most famous parable in the Ezekiel is the Valley of the Dry Bones. And in chapter, chapter 37, in verses 1 and 2, it says, The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me in the middle of the valley. Now, I picture a valley in the West. I grew up in New Mexico, and I think about a, a valley out there where there's lots of sand, not much vegetation, and you can see everything that's on the ground. And they're scattered on the ground, he said. He said, it was full of bones. It was just full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. You get that picture? I mean, a parable is a, is a story that has a vivid picture. And you get this picture, valley full of dry bones. But then he goes on, uh, I don't have this on the screen, but he says, son of man, speak to the bones. Tell them to come together. And (laughs) clattering sound, and they all come together. Now tell them to to, uh, flesh to come up on them, and they do. And now breathe, tell a breath to come, and and they all come alive. And then he says in verse 11, 
Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone and we are cut off. The, the people of Israel were in exile. They had been in exile for some time and they had given up any hope, any hope of getting it out of it, of going back home. They just given up all their hope. They had said, we're dead. We as a nation are dead. Our bones are dried up. And God comes along with this parable to say, ha, we're going to bring the bones together. We're going to put flesh on them. You're going to be a nation again. You're going to do this. And it's a great, a great story, vivid image, and that great interpretation. And that's a parable. Um, mostly I say the, the, the parables are associated with the wisdom literature, um, which is the collected sayings of the wise ones. Most of them were wise men, but some of them were wise women. And uh, uh, in fact, if you want to do a little research, you can go and read in the history, uh, Old Testament history books, and see the two very important wise women who are associated with Joab, who was a, a soldier. Um, so the men and women had these wise sayings and uh, passed them on, collected them, and so on. Um, now, in, the, in Proverbs, which is the, the, the wisdom literature is composed of Job, some of the Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes. Uh, those songs are, those are uh, the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. And then the New Testament, James is really primarily a, a wisdom book. And much of what Jesus said was wisdom teaching. So uh, um, the first six verses of, of Proverbs, uh, the authors have collected all this together. And they say, now, okay, this is what these verses that these Proverbs are gathered here for. And I won't read the whole thing for you, but a real good exercise would be for you to take your Bible and turn to the first six verses of, of Proverbs and look up all those words. It would be very educational for you to see, as he says, this is what the Proverbs are here for, to teach all these things. It'd be real instructive because they have words that we sort of know what they are and we sort of gloss over them, but they are there. But in, ver in verse 6 of um, chapter 1 of Proverbs, he says, among the, all these other things, it's for understanding Proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. There's Proverbs and there's there's uh, parables here. So, most of the parables in the Proverbs are short. Um, one or two verses. For instance, Proverbs 25, 19. Like a broken tooth or a lame foot is reliance on the unfaithful in a time of trouble. If you've had a toothache, you know what this is about. You got a toothache on this side, you chew on this side. If you forget and chew on this side, the tooth doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It causes you pain instead of that. So it's unreliable. And so uh, depending, depending or relying on an unfaithful person um, in time of trouble is like a bad tooth or a lame, a broken ankle. You just can't depend on it. So a little teaching out of that is... So be reliable. <laughs> be someone that people can depend on all the time. But my favorite parable of the Old Testament is this. Okay. Proverbs 22. Nope, I got that wrong, didn't I? It's Proverbs 11, 22, not 22, 11. Proverbs 11, 22. It says, like a gold ring in a pig's snout. Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. Now, I've read through the scriptures every year for 40 years or something and read the Proverbs a lot more times than that. And every time I came to this verse after I discovered it sometime was, that is funny. That is just funny. A funny picture. A gold ring in a pig's snout. 
And I'd, I'd always just smile and, and go on. And then, you know, after a number of years, you see, proverbs and parables, those sorts of things, are supposed to make you think. Okay? They are vivid images, great stories that make you think. And sometimes you have to think about them for years. Sometimes you need to think about them for years. And so after a number of years of seeing this and kind of chuckling about it and smiling, oh, what a strange picture. Then I began to think, I bet there's more to this. I bet there's more to this than, than I'm looking at. Um, and there is. So I began to unpack that a bit. So let's look at this. A pig's snout. I suppose you're familiar with pigs. Anybody here have a pet pig in the house? Nobody's going to own up to it. I have a friend who has, hey, okay, pet pigs in the house. Nice and clean. Put bows in their hair. You put bows in their hair? No, okay. Um, but um, that's not the picture that the, that the, prov the author of Proverbs had here. They didn't have, they didn't have pigs in the house. Uh, they... Uh, in fact, pigs were unclean animals for the Jews, and so they wouldn't have them on the place, let alone in the house. But pigs, now my brother raised pigs for a while. When he was a kid, he had a 4-H project of raising pigs. He started off with one guilt, had a bunch of pigs, sold some, maybe we butchered one, raised a couple more for uh, as a breeding stock, and so the second year he had a lot of pigs. Now, the thing about pigs is they will make a spot to waller in if they can. They will dump their water trough. Amen? Some of you had pigs? They will dump their water trough. And Brian had those big barns and all that stuff, I guess, much more controlled than uh, my brother had. Uh, and they, they make us mud holes. And they take their snout and they dig around in that. That's what a pig snout, stout, snout does. And they do that to the manure pile too. And if you have a garbage pile, they snoop around in that too. Just That's what a pig snout is all about. A gold ring doesn't belong there. <laughs> a gold ring has been a, a great and valuable and desirable thing for thousands and thousands of years. I'd heard of people wearing gold rings in their nose. When I went to India 30 years ago or so, there were women with gold rings in their nose. And it was very beautiful, and now you see them in Walmart or in church or everywhere here in this country. Gold rings making people beautiful. Gold is shiny. You can put a real shine on it. It's valuable. And it doesn't belong in the snout of a pig. But that's the picture we have here. You get this in mind. So you got a pig snout with a gold ring in it. And it's this pig is pushing that gold ring around through the mud and the manure and the garbage. That's inappropriate use of a gold ring. He said, now, that is like a beautiful woman without discretion. Now, I just have to say, there's a lot of beautiful women here today of lots of different ages. I don't see any ugly ones here at all. <laughs> not a one. Not a one. I have the... I have the, uh, the four most beautiful in the room are sitting here on one row. My daughter, my wife, my daughter-in-law, my daughter. Um, and they're the most beautiful. Um, I, you know, we look at beautiful women because the human beings, human beings like us, we need beautiful things. Some, some guys I know love beautiful trucks or beautiful cars or you know, beautiful tractors. I have two tractors. They're really, they're not very pretty. But, 
we, we love these beautiful things. And women are, they're nice and shapely in their form and all. And we like beautiful women. That's good. That's good. I, uh, when I took Hebrew class, um, the second semester I had Hebrew, maybe the second and third, uh, had a woman professor, and she, she was a beautiful woman too. She wasn't very shapely, and she wasn't, but she, she didn't do anything right with her hair, and she was a mess, but she was extremely bright. Her hobby was learning foreign languages, and so she learned a foreign language every summer. Um, the summer before, she had learned Akkadian, which is an ancient language and so on. But uh, we were studying Genesis, the, 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 the creation stories in Genesis, and she just loved to point out that when God created Eve, she said, you can really translate that as he stacked her up. So she is really stacked. So yes, that's a memorable thing I learned in Hebrew class. She was really stacked. Beautiful. She was beautiful. So, so is a beautiful woman, here's the problem, who shows no discretion. If she doesn't show discretion, she's like the gold ring in the pig snout. Well, discretion. Discretion is the quality of behaving or speaking in such a way as to avoid causing offense or revealing private information. Behaving or speaking in such a way as to avoid causing offense or revealing private information. Discretion will protect you. Proverbs, Proverbs 2, um, 11 says that it will, it will protect you. And these days we know if you reveal private information, what happens? You can get your identity stolen right quick. And so you, you know we got to protect this private information. Well, it's behaving or speaking to avoid offense or revealing private information. Now, today, there are people who simply live to be offended. There are some people that are just going to be offended no matter what. But you can't, you don't have to intentionally cause offense. Some people do that. So, behavior that doesn't cause offense. So, for instance, we don't, uh, we don't roll our eyes. Oh, here's this preacher again. He's going to go on and on again. Some pig. You know, we roll our eyes or we uh, exchange knowing glances with our friends. Hey, this idiot. We ought to listen to him. We, we, uh, we, uh, my, uh, my favorite illustration of this is uh, I used to go to big preacher meetings. Preachers all over the state come. And I was a very small fish in a big ocean. And uh, so there were people who would come and, and uh, greet me, shaking my hand. Some of them I really enjoyed seeing them, talk to them, listen to them. And, uh, and then there were others that come and shake my hand. And all the time, they're scanning the room to find someone more important than I am they can go talk to. Ah, was that offensive? Yes. <laughs> you, did. you just really know. I'm really not important to this person. Um, behavior. That makes you ugly. That person may have been very important in the, in the, in the church, but as far as I was concerned, he's kind of ugly. Amen? Because they treated me like that. Mm -hmm. Well, someone who has discretion avoids that kind of thing. And speaking, the way we speak, someone who has discretion avoids suggestive talk. Suggestive talk about sexual matters, that sort of thing. Um, 
because that may cause offense. Have you been offended by someone who talked that way? Yes. Um, maybe you have offended people by that. Repent. Um, um, avoid suggestive talk, and especially it reveals private information or information that's not good or healthy. Someone who has discretion avoids gossip. The Bible says that gossip, gossip is like delicious morsels, <laughs> really tasty, but really destructive. So we avoid that kind of gossip. Someone who has discretion avoids um, bragging about their wealth in public, dropping little hints. To, yes, well, uh, I, uh, you know, uh, the market's been pretty good, but I've lost quite a bit of money as, as, as the downturn. Come on. Uh, we, don't have to, we don't have to say those things. We're revealing private information that may make someone feel uncomfortable, and it's, they don't need to know that. And we just we just don't need to we don't need to, it's so easy to do. Um, someone who has discretion doesn't air the family dirty laundry. We used to talk about this. I used to hear this all the time. Oh yeah, she's airing the dirty laundry again. And he goes like this: My husband is such a slob or whatever it is. All right, here's the details. And off we go. Uh, or my wife is this. Does anyone need to know that? No. That's private information. That's your own dirty laundry. Keep it at home. Put it in the, in the washing machine and, you know, take care of it. Um, oh, my kids are driving me crazy. Now that will get you honorable membership in some belly aching clubs for everybody to say, yeah, my kids are driving me crazy too. So that's not, that's not helpful. That's not good. And if your kids hear you saying that, it makes you kind of ugly in their eyes. It doesn't make them feel good. It may spur them on to rebellion even more. So we don't air the family laundry. Speaking or behaving in such a way, you know, this is really convenient. Uh, there's no clock in here. Wopsle told me that he usually speaks for about 25 minutes. I usually speak about 40. So I've been really hurrying to get all this material here. I don't have no idea what time it is. So I'm just going to finish after a while. <laughs> Not right now. Um, so, a beautiful woman who lacks discretion. Well, there's, the Proverbs also talk about men. This is like a polluted well, a poison stream. Is a good man who gives way before the wicked. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about men and women both here. We all need discretion we just, to avoid offending people. And avoid just, you know, this has to do with how you dress, too, ladies and gentlemen. Are you revealing too much private information with what you're exposing as you dress? And guys who wear the, the muscle shirts, guys that can really show off their muscle, well, they're showing too much. That's a lack of discretion. And some people may say, oh, that's really cool. And other people will say, that's really ugly. It's really strong, but that's really ugly. We don't need to see all of that. And the nice young ladies don't need to see all of that. So how we dress, how we act, what we talk about, how we behave, um, those things can make us beautiful or make us ugly. See now why I like this proverb. Isn't this cool? It is all this, and, and uh, you know, when we're like that, we're, we're like 
doing those bad things, we're, we're like, we're just getting mud, manure, and garbage all over us, like the gold ring. Uh, who wants that? No. Now, let's, I want to look a little broader at this, take a little broader application. Um, in showing discretion on how we talk about church and how we talk about other churches. Uh, how do you speak about other churches? Uh, not too long ago, I was talking to a, a fellow, and he, he said, oh, this building next to mine was, um, was for sale, and somebody bought it. And I just was going to say, yeah, he's a friend of mine that bought that building. He said, bunch of Mennonites. Well, he was a Mennonite. And this fellow betrayed that he didn't think highly of Mennonites. I happen to think highly of Mennonites, especially this guy who is a friend of mine, and I know he's a, a fine, upstanding man. Uh, how do you speak about other churches? Well, he spoke badly about Mennonites. No one else would do that, right? How about holiness? Holiness. Anybody want to speak badly about holiness? Uh, we do. We do. Um, I don't. I had a friend, he used to tell me a long time ago, he said, oh, you're half holiness. Well, that's not bad. That's not bad. How do you speak about other churches? Hey, well, there's a bunch of liberals in that church. I always dismiss them. You know, that makes us ugly, doesn't it? They don't want to see us when we talk badly about them. They don't want to see us. We're making ourselves ugly. How do you speak about other churches? When, uh, when I first retired, we started visiting a different church every Sunday. It was really educational. We did about for two years, and we went everything from Antiochian Orthodox Church to Pentecostal churches of all kinds and about everything in between. And what we discovered was God was there in almost every one of them. One, we left early, but the rest of them, we stayed. And you know, we found God was there. Sometimes he was there in the music. Sometimes he was there in the prayer time. Sometimes he was most manifest as the preacher brought a message that was anointed. Sometimes he was there just in the congregation that people just loved one another and loved visitors and the Holy Spirit was there. And we discovered, you know what? God's there in nearly all of these churches. So maybe we shouldn't speak badly about them if the Holy Spirit's willing to be there. Maybe we should be willing to be there too. Be with them. Uh, sometime back, uh, it occurred to me about the way we think about other churches. Um, there'll, there'll come a time, there'll come a time, the scripture says, and history will tell us for sure, there will come a time when this is not legal anymore. Sitting here worshiping together will not be legal. And people will be killed for speaking the name of Jesus. It's happening all over the world. Now, lots of places in the world, this is happening. And if the scripture is true, which is it is, and if history has any indication, this will happen here also. And when that time comes, they're not going to say, are you a Baptist, are you a Methodist, are you independent, are you what? They'll say, do you confess Jesus Christ as Lord? Yes. Boom. Next. Do you confess Jesus Christ as And it has occurred to me, if we can die together, maybe we should live together. Yeah. Your church... Your church, how do you speak about your church? Glowingly, I can tell you everything we heard. And, and uh, it's wonderful. This has been wonderful. This has been wonderful. But, um, this has really been wonderful. 
How do you talk about the church? How do you speak? How shall we speak and act when we get together? Well, with discretion. Speak and act with discretion. Speak and act so that someone else in the church, when, you, when your kids say to their kids, hey, can you come to our house this afternoon after church? that you know it's safe for them to go there. So you know that they're going to support the same morals, the same ethics that you have. Speak and act in such a way that people will trust you with their children. Important, not so rare as it appears in this day, but you can trust your children with lots of people. Be those people. In the church, the fellowship of the saints is so important. We are a collection of gold rings. We are a collection of gold rings. All of us with a little mud or manure or garbage still hanging on. We're... We've hung out in the wrong places sometimes, and sometimes that mud, manure, and garbage is still hanging on. So we need to be a place where we extend grace to one another, and we invite, in, we invite the ugly, and they can come and find the beautiful. We have to recognize that we are all gold rings with some mud and manure and garbage still on us. And we're not perfect. And we can't roll our eyes at other people because, look, if it wasn't for the grace of God, you'd be in worse shape than that. Um, be a place that's safe. Be a place where modest and discreet dress is normal, not odd. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, a place where you can have fun without being off-color or worse, vulgar. Years ago, um, I was at a, a, we had a men's Bible study group. Not a lot of us, but we had a lot of fun. In, in this, and before we actually got into the Bible study, uh, one day, one evening, a uh, brother-in-law one of, of one of the other guys came in. This brother-in-law was not a Christian, didn't go to church, didn't love God or anybody else. But he came in and he heard us laughing and over something, just having a really good time. And this man later became a Christian. And he said, you know, when I came to see my brother-in-law and I heard all you guys laughing and having such a good time in church, he said, I realized that this, this gospel is fun. It's good. So be a place where people can laugh and have fun without being off color or vulgar, but where joy happens, where we just enjoy, where Jesus is with us. Now I want to close with this. You are the gold ring. You're the one that the merchant went looking for. And Jesus paid a tremendous price for you. You're the gold ring. Don't forget that. You're not the pig. You're not the mud. You're not the manure. You're not the garbage. You are the gold ring. God loves you very much, and he's seeking you. Let's, um, let's let Jesus clean us up so that we shine, so that we shine. And people will be attracted because we're beautiful and not ugly. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this vivid, vivid picture. Lord, I thank you for the gold rings here. Lord, somebody may be feeling like the mud. Somebody may be feeling like the manure. Lord Jesus, I pray that you'll brush that off and reveal to them the gold 
that they are. How valuable, how beautiful they are to you. Lord, clean us up. Lord, clean us up and make us beautiful. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.